Ubuntu is one of the most popular flavors of Linux and is currently on version 18.04. A new version of Ubuntu is released every six months. This version is based on the year and month of release. The name Ubuntu comes from the South African philosophy of sharing and connecting with humanity. To learn Ubuntu, we'll be installing it inside of Windows 10 in a virtual machine. Think of virtualization as a host entertaining guests. In this case, the host is your Windows 10 PC and the guest will be Ubuntu. Ubuntu will be sharing the hardware with the Windows PC while it's running, so make sure your PC has at least 4GB of memory and about 15GB of free hard disk space. To begin, we download the software. First Ubuntu at Ubuntu.com Then VirtualBox at VirtualBox.org Both are free to download and use. VirtualBox is simple to install and it allows us to create virtual machines in Windows 10. Remember virtual machines are guests in the host system Windows 10. We create a new VM and name it Ubuntu 18.04. We allocate it 2 GB of RAM and create the hard disk for Ubuntu. We set it to have 15 GB of space and finally we create the drive. When we power up the VM, we point it to the Ubuntu file we downloaded earlier. This is similar to putting a Windows install DVD into a computer. The VM boots into Ubuntu and the install process is ready. If you're new to virtualization, hopefully you can see how useful it is. We are able to use another operating system inside of Windows 10 without wiping anything. Installing Ubuntu is similar to installing other operating systems. The setup program guides you through the process. During the install, updates will be installed by using your internet connection, so make sure Windows 10 is connected to the internet. Click Install Ubuntu. Choose your language and choose to install third-party software. Click Install Now. Continue. And make sure the location is correct. Choose your name, computer name, username and password.
Now take a break while the install process completes. This might take up to 10 minutes depending on your hardware and internet connection. Once the install finishes, it's time to restart. After restarting, you're now ready to log in. And that brings us to the end of day one. In day one, you discovered that Ubuntu is a free to use open source operating system with the Linux kernel at its core. You installed VirtualBox to create a virtual machine and downloaded the Ubuntu OS from the official website. You then installed Ubuntu in your virtual machine. That's the end of day one, and I'll see you tomorrow in day two, where we'll learn about the desktop in Ubuntu and more. Welcome back. This is day two of this seven day course to learn Ubuntu. Today we'll look at the desktop and how to use it. We left yesterday at the login screen after having set up Ubuntu in a virtual machine. After logging in, the welcome screen shows us the six main elements of the desktop. The launcher is where shortcuts to favorite software can be placed. If we hover over the icons, we can see what software it is, and if we right click, we get further options, like removing it from the launcher, app details, and other context menus. The dot indicates the app is open. The Apps button is a bit like the Start menu in Windows, because it shows you all the apps installed on the computer. The Frequently Used and All options can be toggled as needed, or you can type it in the Search menu to find an application. The Search option is a powerful way to find installed apps, settings, files, and more available free software that you want to install. The quickest way to get to search is to press the Windows key on your keyboard and start typing. The Windows switcher allows you to rearrange your open apps in workspaces to group or separate apps in organized work areas. This helps to keep your desktops organized and clutter-free. The application menu changes depending on the app that you are currently using. Clicking on the menu displays useful options that relate to the app, and one of the most used is the Preferences option. Clicking on the clock brings up the calendar and notifications area. Notifications like appointments, emails, print jobs, and music currently playing are shown here. Lastly, the system menu gives you a convenient and quick way to get to common settings like the volume control. This is also where you can lock or shut down the system. Before we start customizing the desktop, let's go through the welcome screen. The next option can be useful for servers, and so for this course I'll ignore it. This page allows us to send diagnostic info to help Ubuntu developers, and lastly Ubuntu shows us a selection of free to use apps that can be installed. I'll click done because we'll be looking at installing software apps later in this course. Next, let's update the system to make sure we have all security and software updates installed. You may have noticed that the software updater has appeared, prompting us to install updates. We can also show the updates dialog box by searching for it. Let's go ahead and install the updates.
the authentication box appears for added security to make sure software can't be installed without admin permissions. From time to time, you'll get this update notification, and there will be times when you need to restart your computer. Unlike Windows 10, updates are non intrusive and are quick to install. You can look at the configuration for updates by searching for the Software and Updates app and clicking on the Updates tab. You can also see updates are checked daily and security updates are downloaded and installed automatically, but other updates are displayed weekly. The Additional Drivers tab searches for and shows any other drivers that can be used. The Freedom of Linux gives us the option to choose closed source drivers from manufacturers or the open source versions created by the community. The point here is that you have the choice to decide. In general, if something doesn't work properly like the graphics card or you need additional functionality for gaming, you would use the closed source drivers. Otherwise, the open source versions can be used. I think it's time to customize the desktop. Just like Windows, we right click the desktop and change the background. We can also change the background for the lock screen by using the included images, images added in the pictures folder, or by using a color instead. You may have noticed that the dialog box has lots of other settings. This is because it's part of the settings app that can be accessed from the system menu. You can think of the settings app being like the control panel in Windows. You'll find settings for things like the Wi Fi, Bluetooth, and the dock. You can change the visibility of the dock as well as the size of the icons. You can also change its position. The notifications area can also be customized to choose which apps show notifications and whether notifications appear when the screen is locked. When using search, we can customize what is searched for and the priority of each search category. Most of the settings are fairly self explanatory, while others will be looked at later in this course. The easiest way to find a setting quickly is to click on the search icon and start typing. Now let's look at the Files app where you can manage your files and folders. Just like other operating systems, there are folders already created for common uses. The title bar can be used to move back and forth between locations, search for files, change the view, and customize the way files and folders are displayed. We can use this icon to create a folder. Use this icon to display a new tab. And use this icon to create a quick access bookmark to the new folder we just created. Unlike Windows, Linux doesn't use a C drive. Instead, the main drive is mounted in the root directory, which is identified by a forward slash. This is where the system files are kept. One of those folders is called the home directory, and this is where user data is stored, like my home folders. The Files app makes searching for and managing files easy, simple, and intuitive. The last thing we'll do today is set up a user. This could be a family member, a work colleague, 
or a friend who wants to be able to use your computer. From the settings menu, we open the settings app and search for user options. At the moment, I'm the only user. To add another user, I unlock the interface and click add user. I set the user up with standard permissions and allow the user to set their own password. I sign out out of my account. And sign in as the new user. When logging in, we are prompted to set a password. The account can be customized by using the account settings options in the system menu. Today, we looked at the six desktop elements, updated our system, installed drivers, made customizations explored the settings app, learned about the files app, and created a user account. That's the end of day two, and I'll see you tomorrow on day three, where we'll work with software and hardware in Ubuntu. Welcome to day three of this seven day course to learn Ubuntu. Today we'll be learning about the Ubuntu software app, and then we'll learn how to prevent data loss. The Ubuntu software app can be accessed by clicking on the shopping bag icon in the launcher or by simply pressing the Windows key also known as the super key in Linux and searching for a relevant keyword. The app is used to find, install, remove and manage software. From here you will see apps are organized in groups which makes finding software easy and simple. This is very similar to the Apple or Android app stores which most people are familiar with. In line with the open source philosophy of Linux, the majority of the software available is free to use and is open source. If the software is only a trial or is not open source, the details of the app clearly shows this. Before installing an app, we can see a summary, some images of the app in action and a short description. In the details section at the bottom, we see further details like its version, its size and its source. Ubuntu stores its software in online repositories, also known as repos, which are listed in the Software and Updates app. These are the official repos for Ubuntu, but you can also add other repos here. You should only add repository addresses in here if you know they are a trusted source. When searching for software, Ubuntu checks the official repos as well as those added here. Any software in the official repos has been verified and tested to work with your version of Ubuntu by its developers. Let's install the Only Office app, which is a free alternative to Microsoft Office. When we click the install button, Ubuntu goes to its official repos and locates the software, downloads it and installs it for you. We add it to the launcher, but we can also search for it using the super key. The app is installed and we can begin using it. The install button at the top of the Ubuntu software app shows us all software installed on the system and we can see only office listed as well. To remove only office we simply click the remove button. A quicker way to find software you know the name of is by using search. Search shows us the results from the Ubuntu software app and this is a quick way to install only Office again. There's lots of apps to choose from but not all Windows apps are available on Linux. For example, Adobe applications are not supported on Linux. Fortunately, there are open source alternatives like GIMP to replace Adobe Photoshop for example. Later in this course, we'll be installing popular software for email, multimedia and gaming. The Ubuntu software app is easy to use and makes finding new software simple. 
Lastly today, we'll use the backup software, simply called Backups. This software makes it easy to backup your precious data by allowing you to choose the files and folders to save, making the process automatic. By default, my home folder and all its contents will be backed up. The only two folders that won't be are the Recycle Bin and the Downloads folder. The contents of my home folder can be saved to a cloud location like my Google Drive or to a local location like an external hard drive. Lastly, we can decide how often my data will be backed up by turning on Automatic Backup. Ubuntu prompts us to install another package that's needed for the Backups app. We can also set a password on the backup files which will be needed if we ever need to restore the data. This is recommended for security but for this demo I'll continue without setting a password. With these settings my home folder and its contents will be saved to my storage location every week. This takes only a few minutes to set up but may save many hours or days if your hard drive ever failed. If that did happen you would install Ubuntu on a new hard drive and use the Restore option to grab your backed up files from your cloud drive or your USB drive. Today you learned that finding, installing, removing and managing software is simple and quick to do in Ubuntu. You also learned about using the Backups app to make sure that your data is safe in case of a hardware failure. Tomorrow in day 4 of this 7 day course to learn Ubuntu, we'll be setting up email and using internet browsers. I hope you're enjoying this course and I'll see you tomorrow. This is day 4 of this course and today we'll be browsing the internet and setting up email. Firefox is the default browser in Ubuntu and is open source and free to use. It's fast and there are many add-ons that can be used to increase its functionality. Most users use Chrome and this can be installed in Ubuntu by downloading the deb install file. Deb files are like exe files in Windows and contain the install files needed for an application in Ubuntu. When we double click the deb file, it opens in the Ubuntu software app. Chrome is not open source software. The install file also adds the Google Chrome repo to the system. This means whenever there's an update available for Chrome, the update will be downloaded from the repo. The install process is the same as other software and Chrome is now ready to use. The default email client in Ubuntu is Thunderbird and it's made by the same company that develops Firefox. Thunderbird is already added to the launcher and setting up email is comparable to setting up Microsoft Outlook. I'll set up my Gmail account which Thunderbird sets up by finding the correct settings for Gmail. I authenticate to my Gmail account and my emails appear in Thunderbird. The layout is similar to Firefox with emails opening in tabs. Thunderbird can be configured further and customized by using the menu in the top right hand corner. 
For example, we can change the look of Thunderbird by adding a new theme from the Add-ons option. The Montreal theme is a popular theme and works well with Thunderbird and Ubuntu. Although this is a capable mail app, you may find yourself looking for apps with more functionality, like an integrated calendar. The Evolution Mail app is something more comparable to Outlook, which will install from the Ubuntu software app. Before starting Evolution, we'll integrate my Google account with the Ubuntu system. To do this, I configure the online account settings so that my email, contacts, calendars and Google Drive integrate with Ubuntu. I can opt out of the settings I don't want to integrate. When I open Evolution, my email is set up. My calendar is also synced with Evolution. By configuring the online account setting, my Google Drive is also available to store and access my files. For example, I use LibreOffice Writer to save a document, and it appears in Google Drive straight away. Harry is another popular email app which works for Microsoft Exchange and Office 365 accounts. It isn't open source and can be installed as a 7 day trial. The app does a really good job of simplifying the layout which allows us to focus on emails, tasks and appointments.
Tasks can be turned on from the Skills menu where you can also find other skills. Another email app is MailSpring, which is free to use as long as you set up a free account. MailSpring supports a range of email providers and is easy to set up. There's also a pro version, but as you can see, the free version is already a polished premium product. It also integrates well with Ubuntu. Today, we looked at some internet browsers, email apps, and integration with cloud accounts. Tomorrow in day 5, we'll look at how Ubuntu handles music and video. Stay tuned and I'll see you then. Welcome to day 5 of this course and today we'll be listening to music and watching videos in Ubuntu. The default music app is Rhythmbox and the icon is included on the launcher. In the preferences of the app, we can set the view and the way music is organized. Any music stored in the music folder is automatically added to the library in Rhythmbox and arranged by the settings in here. We can also change things like the album, artist, as well as find album art from the internet for each track. To edit multiple tracks, we use the shift key to select multiple tracks. Setting up playlists is also quite simple and it's just a matter of right clicking on a track and using the add to playlist option. Playlists are saved in the hidden.local folder, in share, and then the Rhythmbox folder, and are saved as an XML file. When playing music, the controls are shown in the bottom panel and also in the notifications area, including player controls. If you find that some of your files don't play, you should install the Ubuntu Restricted Extras Deb Package. It can be found by searching for it and clicking on these links. The deb file installs codecs which are able to understand how to play the different types of audio files. Another useful feature is the podcast option. Rhythmbox needs a URL of a podcast and it takes care of the rest. I can go to the iTunes podcast list for example and copy the URL of a podcast.
In the podcast collection, I click add and the URL is automatically copied to the search box. I search for the podcast and click subscribe and close. Podcast episodes are now added and I can listen to my favorite episodes with ease. For those of you who prefer streaming music for free, the Spotify app is just one click away. Spotify is free to use and is paid for by ads that play in between music tracks. It's simple to use and I find it a great way to find new music. The daily auto-generated playlist adds variety to my listening pleasure. I also recommend the VLC media player, especially if you have a problem playing a file, because usually VLC will be able to play almost anything. It also plays audio files as well as video. The default app for videos in Ubuntu is simply called Videos, and to be honest looks quite bland and uninteresting. One nice feature though is the Channels button. Using this you can watch movie trailers from within the player. In the audio and video section of the Ubuntu software app, you'll find lots of music and video players that you can install and try out. For example, Audacity is the go-to software for audio recording and editing. And Clementine and Amarok are popular music players. Today we looked at audio and video players in Ubuntu and found that there's a wide selection to choose from for free. Tomorrow in day 6 of this course to learn Ubuntu, we'll be using photo apps to manage and edit photo collections and also look at gaming in Linux. It's day 6 of this 7 day course to learn Ubuntu. Today we'll be looking at managing photos as well as making simple edits and then we'll see how to game in Linux. When opening images in Ubuntu, they open in an app called Image Viewer. The app shows thumbnails in a bar at the bottom that makes it easy to view photos and images. In the Preferences menu, you'll find other options that provide more information about your photos as you browse through them. The Shotwell app is the default photo manager and you can import your collections to organize your photos using tags, titles, comments and more. Browsing your collection is easy. Details about your photos and images are shown in the bottom left hand corner. Making quick edits is simple with the buttons at the bottom. Edits are made without having to save a new file and edits are completely reversible. This can be done with the revert to original option. Any changes made are saved to Shotwell's internal database, but the original file remains intact, meaning that you can make edits without affecting the original photo. To save a change, use the export option and save with a new file name. GThumb is a more powerful photo manager. There are many more options to organize and catalog images and it also includes an auto-organize feature based on date, tags and modify date. When you have lots of photos to transfer from your digital camera, the organize feature can be a real time saver. The top bar has several options for viewing and editing images.
Gthumb is simple yet powerful to use with an easy to understand interface. For more advanced editing and creative work with images, the GIMP app is the Linux alternative to Photoshop. Just like Photoshop, you'll need to learn how to use the software and creatives from around the world have come to rely on GIMP for their professional work. Next, let's look at gaming in Ubuntu. The best way to play games in Linux is to install the Steam app, which makes buying, installing and running games really simple. You can install Steam from the Ubuntu software app. The install may take some time and while it installs it may look like nothing is happening. Be patient and wait for the login screen. In Steam, filter for Linux games and you'll be able to buy and play games like Rocket League, Tomb Raider and CSGO. Unfortunately, the choice is not as wide as on Windows, but there is still a good selection. Just like Windows, you need to make sure that your computer has good enough hardware for the game you want to play. The requirements for each game is listed in the details section. Most importantly, you should make sure the correct driver is installed for your graphics card. Today we looked at the Image Viewer app, the Shotwell Photo Manager app and some more advanced image apps like Gthumb and GIMP. We also looked at installing and running Steam in Ubuntu for buying and playing games. Tomorrow in the final day of this course, we'll learn about the Linux terminal. Don't worry though, you don't have to be a computer expert to use it because even with some basic commands, you can learn how to do things more quickly and effectively in Ubuntu. Stay tuned and I'll see you tomorrow in day 7 of this course. You've probably watched films where a computer whiz opens a terminal and hacks into a top secret file or network. Today in the final day of this course to learn Ubuntu, we'll demystify the Linux terminal and learn some useful commands. The terminal can be accessed by searching for it or pressing the shortcut key Ctrl, Alt and T. A blinking cursor and an empty terminal can seem intimidating at first, so we ask the terminal for some help by simply typing in help and pressing the enter key. As well as showing us some commands and their syntax, we are told to use info bash to learn more. When I type info bash, we learn that bash is a command line interpreter. This means that any commands we type into the terminal are interpreted by bash, executed and the result is shown in the terminal. Press Q to exit and let's try a command. When I type in the clear command and press enter, the screen clears. The command to open Firefox is just Firefox and you can see that the browser opens as requested. Running a program in the terminal like this is a good way to troubleshoot an app which isn't launching because errors are displayed in the terminal. By default, the terminal starts in the logged in user's home drive, so if I use the list command, the contents of my home folder are listed. Using the list command is exactly the same as viewing the folders in the files app. To look inside the music folder, I use the change directory command with the name of the folder and then I use the list command. The command line shows that I'm in the music folder and the blue color of the files indicate that they are folders. I use the change directory command again to go into a folder and list the contents. These files are shown in a color other than blue, which means they aren't folders. To go back into the home folder, I can use the change directory command without a folder name.
To create a folder, I use the make directory command with the name of the new folder. I also use the touch command to create an empty file in my new folder. Finally, I delete the folder and the file within it using the remove command. In just a few commands, we have been able to navigate, create and delete files and folders. The Linux terminal is a very powerful way to work on your computer using only the keyboard. This is how many Linux servers on the internet and in organizations are managed remotely without needing a desktop environment. Let's look at another way to install software in Ubuntu. The sudo command is used to invoke admin rights and the apt command is used to manage and install software from the Ubuntu repositories. In day 5 of this course we install the Ubuntu restricted extras package by downloading it from the internet. Here we'll install it directly in the terminal by using the install option and the name of the package. The apt command checks the system and identifies the package is already installed. Learning to use the Linux terminal and bash allows you to do things quicker in Ubuntu and gives you a valuable skill that's in high demand in the IT industry. Ubuntu is an amazing free operating system which I use as my main OS having switched from Linux several years ago. Ubuntu also comes in several other flavors which you can check out and try at ubuntu.com. Remember, Linux is a community-powered OS and others like you on other forums are always willing to help if you get stuck. There is also the askubuntu.com website as well as countless other websites on the internet to help you through your Linux journey. Thanks for taking this Learn Ubuntu in 7 days course and I'll see you in the next course.